Why are we improving the ways we diagnose concussions in the NFL, yet lack answers on how to actually address them when they happen? In this video, I'm gonna walk you through what I would be doing if Patrick Mahomes or Lamar Jackson were my quarterbacks to get them back to 100% as soon as possible. Concussions are always at the forefront of conversations when it comes to the NFL. In 2015, the movie Concussion and Dr. Bennett Amalu raised some much needed awareness about the challenges of concussions and ultimately CTE for current and former professional athletes. Recently, we witnessed two of the greatest quarterbacks of all time take hits that ultimately resulted in concussions for both of them and time off. So before we jump into this, let's talk about what TBIs are. TBI or traumatic brain injury is a leading cause of death and disability in infants less than two years old and adolescents from 15 to 18 years old. Additionally, over 20% of pediatric patients who have suffered a TBI experience lifelong physical disabilities, such as cognitive impairments with persistent attention, memory, and concentration deficits as well as emotional disorders with things like anxiety and depression, which can significantly influence academic and work performance and cause profound social dysfunction later on in life. TBIs occur as a consequence of either direct or indirect mechanical force applied to the head. Following a concussion or blow to the head, there's an initial insult to the brain. However, many of the adverse effects we see are caused primarily by secondary injuries or events that take place long after the initial hit or insult happened. The financial burden alone is alarming. The US spends $1 billion per year just on pediatric TBI patients. The NFL is expected to pay out well over a billion dollars and counting in their recent settlement with former players who are now experiencing long-term deficits or even CTE. CTE, or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, is a degenerative brain disease found in athletes, military veterans, and others with a history of repetitive brain trauma. In CTE, a protein called tau forms clumps and slowly spreads throughout the brain. You've probably heard that before with things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, which we'll talk about later on. This tau kills brain cells. CTE has been seen in people as young as 17, but symptoms do not generally begin until years after the onset of the head impacts. Early symptoms of CTE usually appear in patients late 20s, 30s, and affect a patient's mood or behavior. Some common changes seen include impulse control problems, aggression, depression, paranoia. As this disease progresses, some patients may experience problems with thinking and memory, including memory loss, confusion, impaired judgment, and eventually progressive dementia. So the next thing we're gonna jump into is how big of an issue truly is this? In short, huge. One in five high school athletes sustains a concussion during the regular season, right? 90% of diagnosed concussions don't result in loss of consciousness. So they often go uh, mis misdiagnosed or undiagnosed, but even the ones that are diagnosed, you really don't see a loss of consciousness, which is a real big problem. 47% of all reported sports concussions occur in high school, right? Kids. A CTE study in 2017 found evidence of brain disease in 110 out of 111 former NFL players. After years of denials, the NFL acknowledged a link between head blows and brain disease and agreed to over the billion dollar settlement to compensate former players who had accused the league of hiding the risks. So clearly, this is a huge issue. And if I had to guess, this is only going to continue to go up as more testing, innovation, and science evolves to identify these deficits. In fact, players are paid up to $5 million to, give, to kind of put this in perspective, depending upon their type of cognitive or neurological problem, which, which can include things like ALS and Alzheimer's disease and the age and time at which their illness was diagnosed. So that ultimately brings us to how does the NFL handle concussions now? 
right? And this isn't going to be an argument over if the NFL is now soft and whether you slap someone in the helmet and it's immediately a 15 yard penalty. Instead, let's discuss the actual protocol that they put in place, right? The head, neck and spine committee founded the concussion protocol in 2009, right? In addition to spotters, they have spotters on the field to be able to identify this, each team has an assigned neurotrauma expert who monitors the players from the sidelines. They help monitor and evaluate a player's condition. Some signs the team looks for are loss of balance, loss of consciousness after a hit. They watch for signs of confusion, disorientation, head clutching, facial injuries, slow movements, and a whole bunch of different things, right? Whether it's a hard hitting play or just general play in, in the game. Whenever they spot these signs, the player will go to the medical tent, the locker room, the hospital for evaluation. And that's when the concussion protocol goes into effect for this athlete. The entire protocol that they recommend for athletes after being diagnosed involves rest and just resting enough to ensure what they call a player returns to baseline status of symptoms and neurological exam, including cognitive and balance function, right? That's all their recommendations is rest until a player returns to normal cognitive and balance function. So, Let's, let's talk about how I would treat myself or my athletes if I was in that situation. First and foremost, I'm gonna put up a medical disclaimer because I'm not your doctor, I'm not pretending to be your doctor, and this isn't medical advice. Um, I actually wrote an article on this, and we'll put the link inside the bio talking about ketosis and traumatic brain injury, a former athlete's perspective. Um, so really, really interesting stuff, but let's talk high level science and some things, and I'm gonna break it down on the board for things that I would do or I would implement. Um, the first thing that I'll talk about is ketosis, right? Um, following a concussion, the brain has an increased demand for energy, right? This makes sense. The brain is doing its best to increase energy uptake and to recover and overcome the repeated blows or blow that it's taken, right? However, there's one slight problem. The brain also has an impaired ability to take up and utilize glucose during this time. Yet, what do players go over to the sideline and slug down, right? In fact, after the initial injury period, brain glucose use is diminished 24 hours and remains low five to 14 days on average, and sometimes up to months, depending upon the severity of the injury, right? What if we had an alternative source of fuel for the brain? Well ketones are that alternative source of fuel for the brain. I'll, I'll demonstrate why I think they could be a great tool in these scenarios. We also know that ketones can lower free radical production and inflammation. We know that ketones can improve mitochondrial number and function. We know that ketones can help increase ATP or energy in the brain, right? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to draw on the board uh, a series of things indicating what I would be implementing, right? Beyond just being in ketosis, what are some other things, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, other supplements, other protocols, and why they might have an impact. So let me break down for you what the brain looks like after a traumatic brain injury or after these repeated bouts to the head, right? So to disregard my terrible drawing, but uh, for argument's sake, let's say that this was a brain, right? It doesn't really look like one, but there's different transporters going into our brain. There's two different types, right? There's MCT2 transporters, which transport things like ketones into the brain. And then there's GLUT4 receptors, right? These things that transport glucose. Well, after this initial hit, right? After you experience a traumatic brain injury, there's blockage to these GLUT4 transporters, right? It's as if the gate closed. And yet these athletes or people go over to the sidelines or even our military go and they go and have a bunch of glucose. Yet the gate that's allowing that glucose to get into the brain is closed. Right? Think about that. The fuel, the brain needs more fuel, yet the fuel that we're providing it isn't getting into the brain because the door's closed. Yet what some of our, some colleagues, Prince and, and uh, his partner, basically what they found is there was greater increases in uh, the MCT transporters after a TBI. Like they took animals, they uh, basically exposed them to a TBI, right? Tough, tough study to do. But what they found is they looked at the transport capacity and after this TBI, the transporters, these tunnels that take up and utilize ketones, increased. 
It's as if your brain knows, hey, I'm no longer able to utilize carbohydrates and glucose as well, yet I can still utilize ketones, provide them to me. Now, are athletes like Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson on a ketogenic diet? No, so you might be thinking, well, how do you do that, right? This is where a perfect application for exogenous ketones could come into play. And I think this is what the future holds in large part for exogenous ketones. I'm excited for the day where on the sidelines, instead of things like Gatorade, you're seeing exogenous ketones there because that's what athletes need uh, after some of these repeated hits to the, to the head, right? So that's one way, right? Entering in ketosis, utilizing exogenous ketones, right? You wanna make sure you're using the right form. I have an entire video on exogenous ketones, what they are and what they are not. Uh, so you can check that out as well. Um, but some of the other things that I would implement as well, immediately, right? Someone gets a, a big hit or they experience repeated bouts and they're showing signs of a concussion, immediately bring them over. I would immediately get them started uh, with exogenous ketones, right? Provide an immediate source of fuel. Within 10, 15 minutes, those ketones are gonna get taken up and utilized at, at, by the brain. Give the brain fuel, right? Period, first and foremost. Second, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. If you're taking them back into the locker room, I would have hyperbaric oxygen therapy tanks or, or uh, tunnels inside of there so that way they can go in and get hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Lower the amount of inflammation going on inside of the brain, right? High amounts of fish oil, another thing, right? High omega-3 content, high EPA and DHA, you wanna get something that's a good quality, not your generic Walmart brand or anything like that. Like you wanna get a good quality fish oil, taking probably two grams plus of combined EPA and DHA to lower that inflammation and, and help with the brain. And studies have shown that as well. Um, sleep, right? Sleep helps clear out. Good amounts of sleep help clear out things like tau plaques. When we don't sleep well and we have, we have sleep deprivation, tau plaques tend to build up, right? Over time anyway. So getting in good quality sleep is essential, right? And figuring out ways to do that, right? Sleeping in a cold room, blue light blocking glasses, all things that we've talked about before on how to improve the quality of sleep we should be implementing in these scenarios. BCAs and protein, there's been studies looking at increasing the amount of branched chain amino acids or protein content can actually help with some of that recovery process when it comes to TBI. Antioxidants, right? High antioxidant foods. You wanna lower free radicals. You wanna lower free, um, reactive oxygen species. Things like unsweetened dark chocolate, right? Pecans, blueberries, spinach, right? All of these are low carb, lower sugar but they have a high antioxidant content. Consuming these foods over the next couple of days and weeks are things that I would be implementing. And IV, right? After a TBI, there's something known as glutathione. It is the master antioxidant depleted immediately after a traumatic brain injury. I would hook an athlete up, boom, or myself up, immediately in the locker room, have them slug down ketones, get them in hyperbaric oxygen therapy, boom, get them in a, on an IV with high amounts of glutathione. Um, that they can handle, right? As long as it's properly monitored by a doctor. And then the last one's more experimental, one that is super interesting, and that's stem cells, right? Um, there are people who have suffered from CTE, indicating success with stem cell therapy. Uh, I think it, it holds a lot of promise for the future, as long as you're getting in good quality and the right form of stem cells. Um, but it really ultimately depends. That one's more experimental, way more expensive, right? You're looking several thousand uh, to tens of thousands of dollars for that. But the rest of them are a lot more feasible, right? And financially feasible for most people. And so, like I said, I don't think this isn't medical advice. This isn't me saying, hey, if you get a concussion, this is exactly what you need to do. If it were me, or those were my athletes or my son or my daughter um, experiencing that, these are things that we would implement, right? And these were things that we would take forward because there's data and science to back each one of these, right? Uh, first do no harm, like none of these would have or have shown any negative adverse side effects, especially when monitored by a proper doctor or physician. So I hope that helps. Um, recently seen the Super Bowl, right? Uh, so I wanted to bring this up because Patrick Mahomes is in there, obviously. Uh, Lamar Jackson uh, took a big hit, but had a stellar year. And we're gonna continue seeing this. You're gonna continue seeing it have an impact at the professional level, at the collegiate level, at the high school level, and even below that, right? And even in sports like soccer, 
right, with headers. There have been studies showing increases in the amount of concussions and TBIs there as well. So let me know your thoughts. Let me know uh, if you want me to cover more topics like this for alternative applications for ketosis. I'm happy to answer any questions. So make sure you subscribe if you haven't. Down below, ask questions. I promise I'll, we'll do our best to get back to you. And let me know what your thoughts on this video are. As always, I appreciate you guys. Make positivity louder, and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much for watching that. If you enjoyed that type of content and you want to see more of it, make sure you subscribe, uh, hit that little bell so you get notified every single time that I put out a new video. Also comment down below and share this with someone that you think could benefit from this information. And lastly, if you want more information on keto or ketogenic diets or ketones, make sure you go to www.ketogenic.com. We have a ton of amazing resources and tools there for you. And also give me a shout on social media at Ryan P. Lowry, L-O-W-E-R-Y. I look forward to seeing you guys and I'll talk to you soon.